What are you doing with your talents? What are you doing with the gifts that God has given you? It's kind of a question that's begged of us today in this beautiful, fruitful gospel. You notice that we're coming towards the end of the liturgical year, and so we're hearing about a lot about the end times and being prepared. And in just another week, we'll be entering into uh, the finishing part of the go- this uh, liturgical season and entering into Advent, a new year with the church. And so God kind of wants us, the church wants us to reflect on our lives in a very particular way. And the question is, what are we doing with our lives? What are we doing with that gift that God has given us? Are you embracing and sharing the talents, the gifts, the charisms that God has blessed you with? Or are you squandering them? Or if you will, as the gospel said, burying them in the ground where there is no fruit born. In the church, there's such a thing as called the law of the gift. St. John Paul II spoke uh, tremendously about this. The law of the gift. What is the law of the gift? It is this idea that when we're giving something by God, particularly grace, that it's a question of what we do with it. So if we share that gift, then the gift multiplies, right? So the law is that when we're willing to give of ourselves, there is a multiplication of the good of God within us. And when we hold on tight to our gifts and we don't share them, then, of course, we're kind of squandering and the gift is then not um, multiplied in our lives. St. John Paul II would often say, we can never know who we are until we give ourselves away. And so, today we hear about that giving of oneself to do something good with the gift that has been given um, to the three men. It's really a question about sharing of the deposit of the faith that we've been given, that we've been blessed with. God entrusts us with this great gift, this unfathomable gift of His grace and of faith, even of Himself. And the question is, are we sharing Him with others? Are we sharing the gift or are we bearing it where it bears no fruit? When we are faithful in small matters, we're reminded this morning, in the small matters of life and the small matters of sharing that which God has blessed us with, God will multiply that. He gives us even more grace than to share with others. I really like how St. Bernard, some would say St. Bernard, St. Bernard speaks of this idea of the law of the gift. He uses an image which is very powerful of a reservoir. A reservoir. If you've ever been um, in the mountains of Colorado, one of my favorite places in the world, you'll see reservoirs tucked away um, in the mountains where the waters are flowing out of the mountains and into these reservoirs where they're caught. And then the reservoirs, as they fill up, they overflow out into the towns and villages around them to provide water. Well, God wants us to be a reservoir. He made us to be reservoirs, in fact, if you will, as St. Bernard would say, that we are to fill up with Him, with His grace, with His goodness. And when we receive those living waters from God, then we can overflow that into the world in which we live. That means we get to share the grace that we've been given. It's really beautiful, if you think about it, that we know that in our own lives, that we often need to pause and fill up. That we can't run on empty in, in the sense of our faith. And so we have to do things intentionally to make sure that we're inviting God to fill us. You're doing that right now. My brothers and sisters, you come to Mass to be filled up with God, to be filled up with His Word, to be filled up with His very body, blood, soul, and divinity, to be filled through the faithful community that gathers together to worship. Right now, we are reservoirs being filled with God's grace, as long as we're open to that grace and are willing to embrace it in our lives. How else do we fill up? Well, of course, we know through prayer, through fasting, through almsgiving, all of these ways. That sounds kind of like Lenten journey, but every day of our lives should be lives of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. That is laying down our lives for others and for God. The sacramental life, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, all of these are ways that we fill up with God's grace. Only by, of course, His gratuitous 
act, action in our lives of desiring to give himself to us in this very beautiful way. We're in Advent soon, and we'll begin a new liturgical year in a preparation for the incarnation of Christ himself. And this is a wonderful time to kind of pause and think about, am I really filling up with God? And if not, to kind of intentionally start to do those things again, which God wants to help fill us up with himself so that we can overflow and multiply his grace into the world in which we live. Like the reservoir, once filled, our lives of goodness and of grace overflow into the world around us. And we share something of God then with our families, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, and even those that we don't even know. I'd like to propose, my friends, that in these days ahead, as we end a liturgical year and begin a new one, and even as we think about the secular but yet sacred time of thanksgiving that we enter upon this coming week, that we consider three ways that God is inviting us to overflow that grace, in other words, give of ourselves to others and to share Him with others in our lives. First is to... Physically claim Christ in our lives and not be ashamed to show others that we are Christian. How so? Well, it can be as simple as wearing something that shows that one is a Christian. Many of you are probably wearing crosses or um, sacred medals today. And that's an outward sign of our inward dignity as a Christian. So it's important that we show people that we're Christians, not to show off, but rather to humbly say, I claim Christ the center of my life. How else can we do that? Well, even in our homes, we can have outward signs, right? Many of you have bought recently the, um, the outdoor nativities that are going into your front yards this Christmas. That's an outward sign of Christianity. It is to claim Christ as our own and to share him with others. In just a few weeks, you're going to see um, some new shirts introduced in the parish life, some new t-shirts, and they're actually part of the Eucharistic Congress that is coming up, and we're blessed to be on the front end of that. And these shirts all have Latin phrases on them. Why Latin phrases? All Eucharistic phrases like, to whom shall we go, or I am the bread of life in Latin. Well, why Latin? Because most people don't know Latin today. And so you're going to know what it says, and then you're going to say, when somebody says, what does your shirt say? You now have the chance to share with them the greatest gift of the Holy Eucharist, to share with them the truth of the body, blood, soul, and divinity that God has given us to be filled up and to be more Christ-like in our own lives. This is an outward sign of our inward Christianity, our inward dignity. Perhaps you work in an office. Is there anything in your office that says you're Christian? A cross, maybe a prayer card, something that you put on the wall? It's important that we claim our Christianity in the workplace. What about the car that you drive? Would anybody know that you're a Christian by the car, by your bumper stickers or your license plate that you've chosen, or by the, cru- by the rosary that hangs on your rear view mirror? Whatever the case, it's important that we share our Christian faith by outward signs. I remember when I was working um, some years ago in career before going to seminary, and when I was kind of having this reversion back to Christ and the church, and a, a scripture that really touched me was, the harvest is abundant, but the labors are few. Therefore, ask the master of the harvest to send out workers. And so I took that scripture and I put it on a little post-it note, and I put it on my computer screen in my office. And it was amazing how many people asked me about that. They're like, what, why did you, what, what's this scripture? What did you choose to do that? And I told them that, you know, it was something that really moved me. That there is need for workers in the vineyard, in the harvest. And that I wanted to be a better worker. And it was a good, work, good way for me to share the faith. And that leads me to the second point of how can we really be people who multiply God's grace by His grace? By speaking about Him. By speaking about our faith. By speaking about the Holy Church. So one of the most natural ways to do this is just in what, what, how people ask us questions. Hey, what have you been up to? Hey, what did you do this weekend when you go to back to work on Monday? Hey, what's going on in your life? Well, we can go off on some tangent of, I watched this game or I did that. Or we can say, I went to Mass Sunday. Um, I heard a pretty average homily, but I took a couple things home. 
I like the priest, though. He's a pretty good guy. You can speak about NCYC that flooded this city this week. 16,000 Catholics here from across the country. We can speak about uh, maybe a small book study or Bible study that we're getting ready for Advent in in our church. Something that allows a conversation to flow about our faith and very naturally because it's who we are and what we do every day. Some years ago, I was doing a marriage preparation for a young couple. He was a dental student, and she was. Um, they were preparing to be married in just a couple months, and they were all the all the wedding preps and so forth. And as I was doing the prep, I asked them, "How did their natural family planning classes go?" I require everybody to do natural family planning classes, and they both smiled, big smiles. And I said, "Well, talk to me." And they said, "Well, not only were they great, Father, we love learning more about natural family planning, but um, the future groom said." Um, you know, Father, remember the first session you had with us? You told us that people were going to ask us how our wedding plans were coming. Because everybody knows we're getting married. And, I, and he said, you told us to be sure to talk about the spiritual preparation you're doing as well. Because it's such a natural way to share the faith. So he said, believe it or not, last uh, a couple weeks ago on a Monday morning, I was in lab. Uh, in my dental lab with everybody, all the, my uh, uh, fellow students. And it was Monday morning, everybody was talking tired, everybody's quiet, everybody's doing their work in front of them, and all of a sudden somebody said, so what did everybody do this weekend? And he thought, well, I took natural family planning classes, not sure I really want to talk about that, father said I should talk about that, what am I going to do? I said, what'd you do? And he said, I said, well, my fiance and I took natural family planning classes. And then he said there was a long pause. No one said anything. And then somebody piped up and said, okay, so what is natural family planning? And then for the next hour, the entire lab listened to him talk about the truth of our church. Most who had never heard of it before. And then afterwards, three approached him, all non-Catholics, asking if they could meet up later to talk more about natural family planning. See, just a simple question, what would you do this weekend? And answering it with something of faith can make a difference to speak about God in the church, in our lives, and multiply the grace in our lives each day. So, to be outwardly Christian, to speak as a Christian, and then sometimes even to be bold and take a risk as a Christian. I would propose that it's the toughest thing to do in some circumstances to really speak about the faith or invite somebody to something more. But to be bold and take a a risk at least once a week makes us even better Christians because we share that which is instilled in us, deeply rooted within us. To invite someone to something more, we would say. One day, as uh, a returning Catholic to the church, I was going back to Mass for the first time in many years. And I went to a little church of Holy Trinity in Edinburgh, Indiana. And I would always kind of sneak in late and sit in the back, and then I'd sneak out early so I didn't have to talk to anybody. I know you guys have never done this before, but I did. And one day after about three times doing this, I'm leaving and walking down the sidewalk right after communion. And this old couple chased me down the sidewalk. Sir, sir. And I'm like, oh no, I have to talk to somebody. And then I I stopped and I turned around and I said, yes. And they said, we noticed that you're new here and we just want to welcome you to our parish. I said, well, thank you. And within about three minutes, they found out that I was working in a career with, with young people, with high school students through the FFA. And about two minutes later, they had me reeled in to being a youth minister for the parish. I don't even know how it happened. They, they said, we need a volunteer. Would you be willing to? You're good with youth. And I'm, I'm like, oh, wow, wow, wow. And all of a sudden, I'm volunteering as a youth minister. Two years later, because of that powerful invitation, I was a seminarian studying to be a Catholic priest. They were bold that day. They chased me down a sidewalk and asked me, welcomed me and asked me if I could participate in something in the church. And I said yes. Our focused missionaries on the campus of IUPUI and throughout the nation do something that's called bare-handing. 
barehanding, it's great because it takes a lot of courage. Barehanding is going out on a secular campus and engaging in a conversation with anybody and everybody about Christ and His church. How many of us would do that? You know, I mean, it's a tough one. And yet barehanding bears much fruit on campuses throughout the country and world. We might call it cold calling if you work in business. It's a cold call. We don't know what we're going to get. We may be shut down. We may be ridiculed. Or there may be a seed planted. A seed planted that leads to something more. The number of times that a missionary or a student that's barehanded has told me that their conversation has led someone to come back to church or to engage in the faith or join a Bible study or go to a national focus conference is unbelievable. So, that's a bold move. But we should all be barehanded from time to time in our lives. Fill up with God and then share God with the world in which we live. These are all just kind of practical invitations that we all have. And I know many of you are doing every day of your life. And so keep it up. It's our journey home to heaven by being a reservoir and overflowing God's grace. It's the multiplication of the gift. Jesus has promised that when we multiply His grace, He will say, Well done, my good and faithful servants. Since you are faithful in the small matters, I will give you great responsibilities. Come and share in the Master's joy.